Central Church, living the gospel of Jesus Christ, being God's love with our neighbors in all places. Joy at Central is being together for friendship. And being together for fun. Joy at Central is caring for one another. In the home or in the hospital. Central is a place that you can call home. Where everyone has a place. And there is a place for everyone. 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 Central Church, across from the Cider Mill in Endicott, serving around the world. Good morning, everyone. Have Mike will speak. I'm Pastor Michelle, and this is Central United Methodist Church. And if you're visiting with us this morning, you are very, very welcome. And I wanted to say hello. I also wanted to say a couple of other things. First of all, we are encouraging folks as they arrive here and as they are worshiping here at this church you love so much um, to check in on Facebook if you have a smartphone with you. Let people know you're here. It's a good thing. Also, you will notice that <clears throat> there's a new bulletin in your hands. First of all, it's one piece of paper. We're saving ink, toner, time, and money. Isn't that nice? Also, you'll see that some things are changed around a little bit. And we're going to walk you through that today and in the coming weeks. Just think, if you're here today, you've got one up on the folks who didn't come back till next week. Because you'll have been through this bulletin once. Isn't that exciting? Anyway, we're going to walk you through it today. Um, it's, a, it's a little different order of service, but hopefully by the end of this service today, we will have praised God. We will have given God glory and we will have grown in our faith even just a little bit. Good morning. If you're joining us as a member of our TV audience, we welcome you and we hope this uh, ministry here enriches your faith journey. If you're joining us for the first time as a visitor, we'd ask that you indicate your presence to the ushers as they make their way to the back of the sanctuary. They have an information packet and a small gift for you and we hope to see you again soon and often. And for those lucky enough to be sitting along the center aisle, if you could take the red friendship pad and uh, indicate your presence in there and pass it down the pew in the row uh, and then pass it back so that we know who's uh, sitting with us this morning and you'll get to greet them later in the service. Uh, before we begin our announcements, we have a minute speaker, Kelly Devine, is going to inform us on some upcoming activities here at Central. Thank you, Tom. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to welcome you to uh, what we just had is called Rally Day. Uh, just wanted to remind everyone here on Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m., we promise to have Sunday school for preschool all the way through adults. Our theme this year is heroes, and we are going to focus on who the heroes are in our lives and how maybe we can become just a little bit more like them. Uh, for parents, if you haven't yet registered your kids for Sunday school, uh, you'll find in the visitor center and outside the office, you'll find these yellow forms. Feel free to fill one out to bring it back to the church secretary or leave it on my desk, give it to me. This helps us to keep our records updated so we can let everyone know what's going on and when. Uh, another reminder, next Sunday, which is September 14th, uh, it will be when uh, we give our third graders their Bibles here at the 11 o'clock service. So if you have a third grader or you know a third grader maybe who hasn't come back yet this year, if you could let them know and have them, you know, you guys could call the office and let the secretary know. Uh, now, I heard the adults out there when I said Sunday school, uh, there are things for you guys as well. What learning opportunities are coming for you, you ask? Well, we are going into fall with two opportunities for adult Christian education. We've got a Sunday morning class here, which is entitled Living the Questions. And starting next week, that will happen in the lounge. And it has various leaders. We're going to have some people share the responsibility for leadership of that class. Makes it interesting. If you want to know more about that, outside the church office, I posted a kind of an outline of what the class is about. You don't really have to come to every single one, so if you miss one, it's okay. 
The other opportunity is what I like to call Mondays with Michelle. <laughs> It's a Monday evening group, which is based, this, this particular one coming up is based on the Bart Ehrman book entitled Jesus Interrupted. You can find more information about that course, I believe, outside the church office, of course, and I think in your bulletin. The group is going to be led by Pastor Michelle, and I don't know if you caught that, but that's why it's Mondays with Michelle. And it'll be this Monday, which is tomorrow, September 8th. And we're going to meet at the Greek Key Restaurant here on Nanakoke Avenue. If you'd like to know more about either of the classes that I've just mentioned, as I said, check out what's outside the church office. Uh, or you could even give me a call and ask. I hope everybody had a wonderful summer. We're all relaxed. Everybody, all kids are going back to school because it really is good to see you back here. And I look forward to another year of teaching and learning and, and just enjoying all our time here at Central Church. So thanks. Thanks, Kelly. It is rally day and the beginning of a new church year. Uh, the calendar is loaded with committee meetings and group meetings. I'd ask you to pay attention to those and participate in those as you are called. Uh, as far as announcements go, I call your attention to the fact that tomorrow evening the painting group is going to start up again. So if you're inclined to help paint, uh, please show up tomorrow as in indicated in the bulletin. The afternoon group will start a week from tomorrow on the 15th. So if you've got any special uh, talents with uh, respect to painting, you're invited to participate, even if it's limited to you missed a spot. We could always use those, that type of help. Um, so again, check your bulletin for a list of events coming up this week, and um, we continue our worship service. Please join me in this morning's call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Listen, the Lord calls out to us offering life. Teach. Teach. Turn, turn, turn us to your ways, O oh God. Walk in the paths of God's purpose with delight. Teach, lead, turn us to your ways, O oh God. With our whole heart, we turn to you and live. And this morning's unison prayer, God of grace and steadfast love, we thank you for calling us to worship together today. We thank you for calling us to live honorably with one another and pray for your grace as we try to do all that you require of us. Increase in us, we pray, the capacity to love you and our neighbors without reserve and to love even those who harm us, not half-heartedly, but with our whole hearts. We bring before you our whole lives. Fill us with your presence, your power, and your purpose. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. And please stand as you're able and join us in singing the first hymn. We are called in the black hymnal number 2172. The first scripture reading for this morning is Psalm 149, verses 1 through 5. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. God's praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise God's name with dancing, making melody to God with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in the people. God adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. We all got a place to sit. How are you? Did you guys all go to Sunday school today? Yeah. I did. I'm so glad you're here. We had a good summer, I'm hoping. Yeah. So I got a question for you. What is a neighbor? Can you tell me what a neighbor is? It's a friend. It's a friend? It's, 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 they live right next to you. They live right next to you, Alex? They live in the same street. They live in the same street? Okay. So when we say we live in a neighborhood, what does that mean? In a street. In a street. In a street, okay. Well, you know, here's another idea. How about if, do you think of Central like your neighborhood too? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah. 
kind of? Do you think of, uh, look at all these people out here. Do you think of them as your neighbors? So neighbors are friends, right? They're people that live near you. Maybe people you spend time with too. Like how about school? You think of those people as your neighbors? Okay. All right. Well, I got another question here. So how, just a guess, how does God want us to treat our neighbors? Nice. Nice? Angie says nice. We all go with nice? Yeah. Yeah? The same way you want to be treated. Oh, like you read this before, mister. (laughs) He's so ahead of me. Okay, so God wants us to love our neighbors like we love ourselves. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we got to treat people the way we want them to be treated, maybe? All right. So I'm going to read this. It says, you want to keep yourself happy, right? We all like to be happy, happy, smiling, and it's a good way to feel. And you have to take care of what you need, right? Do your homework so you don't get in trouble, things like that, right? So you get water when you're thirsty, and you get what when you're hungry? Food? Food. Food. All right. So I think, I think, how do you think God wants us to, what do you think he wants to do with our neighbors? Treat them good? Treat them in the way we want to be treated, in the way we treat ourselves. All right. Well, that being said, it sounds like that's what God wants us to do. So how about if we go from here today and we think about our neighbors, not just the people that live in the house next door, but maybe somebody that sits next to you in school, next to you in church, maybe somebody that lives in the same house with you, a sister, a brother, a mom. Yeah. Okay. You guys want to do a little prayer with me? Okay. I'll have you repeat after me, all right? little prayer. Ready? Dear gracious God, help us to see what others need and to be a good neighbor and to be sensitive and not just think about ourselves and put others first. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Go back and find your grown-ups. Please join me in the responsive verses printed in the bulletin. All things come from you, O God, and our own we have given you. Our dedication this morning is in the Faith We Sing hymnal, number 2036. Give thanks. Please stand as you are able. and loving God, you have brought us through a summer season of sunshine and friends and family, vacations and new places and new sites. You've called us back together again as a community of faith. We give you thanks for all the faces we haven't seen in months, for those still making their way back home. We thank you that you call us as a community to be here, supporting, sustaining, loving, caring. We thank you for your call to us to love each other, no matter the cost. We thank you that you call us to love our neighbor as well. Teach us what that means. Fill our hearts and our minds with a spirit of generosity and hospitality. 
from which love just overflows. We pray for ourselves as a community, but we pray also for others. We've, we've named some already, but we carry others in our hearts. And so in this moment, in this time, Lord, we, we speak out loud the names of those who we're carrying with us today who need help or comfort or peace. Hear us as we speak their names. Holy One, before we even speak them, before we can come up the words, you know the needs. You know each prayer before we bring it. Yet we are bold enough to ask, Lord, in your love, hear our prayers. For we ask each one in Jesus' name and we offer to you the prayer he first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. His second reading comes from the third chapter of Romans, 13th chapter of Romans verses 8 through 14. Don't run up debts except for the huge debt of love you owe each other. When you love others, you complete what the law has been after all along. <coughs> Excuse me. The law code. Don't sleep with another spouse. Don't take someone's life. Don't take what isn't yours. Don't always be wanting what you don't have. And any other don't you can think of finally adds up to this. Love other people as well as you love yourself. You can't go wrong when you love others. When you add up everything in the law code, the sum total is love. But make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of your day-to-day -day obligations that you lose track of time and doze off, oblivious to God. The night is about over. The dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on salvation work that began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute, must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence, in sleeping around and dissipation, in bickering and grabbing everything that's in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. of the Romans chapter is a continuation of the scripture from last week with a lot of the same themes. Paul is dealing with a whole bunch of people all caught up in the rules. You can't blame them after all. They live in Rome, the seat of the empire, the throne of the government, even as far away as Paul is from them. Rome is the rules. But they're starting to get up all caught up in religious rules, too. Now, what you have to know about Paul was that he was trained as a Pharisee, a scholar of the religious law. Paul was a lawyer, if you like. Did you know that? He was a zealous one, too. Rabid, actually. The first we hear of him in the scriptures is when he comes on the scene as a witness to an execution. He was there when Stephen was stoned for following Jesus, which at that point was considered blasphemy. Paul was there to hold everyone's coats while they reached for the rocks to throw. Not a nice man. Paul has been known to love the rules to a crazy deep extent. 
Yet, after his conversion, he shifts his perspective. He still has a deep love and respect for the law. It is the history and tradition of his people, after all. The law is the way they have ordered their lives for countless generations. It's what they know best. It's the way they know God, and the way they know God knows them. So in his context, the religious law is the law of the land as well. It's the way his society works, even under Roman rule and all their laws imposed over. So after Paul meets Jesus in a vision, he begins to understand something he never understood before. He begins to understand that the relationship with God, which he understands that Jesus points to, that relationship is more important than the rules about God. When he realizes that, everything changes. Paul begins to understand and then to teach and to preach and to shout where necessary, and he does shout, that while the law was helpful as the people began to understand God, there's something fundamentally better that happens when we, when we begin to pay less attention to talking about God's requirements and we begin to pay more attention to listening to God's heart. That is an epic shift. I mentioned this last week, but it's important and we can't lose sight of our tendency to do this. You probably have noticed that Christianity often gets into patterns of rulemaking and rule keeping. If you didn't know that yet, I promise it's true. Christians through the ages have made rules about all sorts of things, from what kind of clothes you're permitted to wear, to what kinds of instruments or not you can have in church, to who can come in which door, to who can be seen with whom. We put those rules out there as, as if that's what makes us right with God. And we use them as a marker of righteousness and entitlement. You know, lots of folks, including me, like having rules and checklists. Those kinds of structures help us define ourselves and others. They help us know if we're getting things done that we need to get done. They help us know if we're getting things right. Truth be told, the, the whole rules and checklist thing is especially useful for some folks who like to identify when someone else is getting something wrong. But Paul says that rules that outline our interactions with God are for children in faith. They're building blocks to maturity. But, he says, we can't get stuck in that childhood place. We don't expect today even adults to follow rules meant for children, do we? You'll read this all through the Paul writings. He actually expects Christians to grow in maturity as they grow in faith. He says this shocking thing. He says all the rules, all the commandments, all those legalisms all add up to two things. Love God and love each other as you love yourself. If that sounds familiar, it should. It's not original. Jesus said it first. It all comes down to love. The rest is details. I really do think that's a viable reading of Paul, by the way. Love God, love your neighbor, the rest is details. It helps you actually to think of Paul that way and then you, know, you can get through all those run-on sentences that he does. When we get bogged down in the rules, we lose sight of God. Keeping track of good deeds done, who is in, who is out, making sure I and everyone else measures up to what I believe God requires, takes enormous amounts of time and energy. But we do it anyway. Christians tend to make rules about how to be spiritual too. When to pray, how to pray, what's supposed to happen when you pray, what's wrong with you if it doesn't happen when you pray. You know, if you say the right prayer, you'll be saved. If you're faithful and righteous, God will reward you monetarily and materially. 
those kinds of preachers who lay down those kinds of rules are out there. And they offer a very compelling spirituality for those who need checklists. I don't agree with them, by the way. I don't really think that's what Jesus was about. Instead, and this is what Paul says, concentrate on God. Earlier in this letter, he says, turn your entire attention on God and you will be transformed from the inside out. That's the miracle. That's the salvation work. When we let go of our rules and our expectations and we spend our time and energy instead on clearing a space in our hearts and our lives for God's presence, everything else makes more sense. Everything else falls into place because love takes over. Imagine what your day would look like if instead of doing devotions or saying prayers like they're a task to complete, I know you're out there, we decided instead to devote our day to God. In other words, to stop and to be deeply grateful for each meal we eat. Or to stop and not just say thank you, but to feel the gratitude for a blessing you experience. What if we looked for God's presence in every single thing that happened every single day? Yeah, that sounds a lot easier than it really is. But Paul is always telling the people in his congregations, keep trying. Keep looking, keep refocusing, keep talking with God, keep building that relationship. He says, pray continuously. Look for God's work around every corner. Most of us, most of us are just not that attentive. And we're far from being that intentional. Paul's point is that if you can be attentive to your own needs and your own wants and your own to-do list every day, then certainly you can give that same attention to God. When we do that, that's when we begin to understand what salvation looks like. So how do we do that? Most of us are not spiritual powerhouses. Raise your hand if you are. I did that in the first service and somebody did. <laughs> Dare ya. Most of us are not spiritual powerhouses. Most of us don't know how to focus on God constantly or consistently. When we try, you know, we keep expecting something to happen, you know, or to feel a certain way. Most of us expect some signal back from God that God is paying just as much attention to us as we are paying to God in that particular moment. But you see, that's about rules and checklists again. Remember, love comes first. So if you feel like you're not one of those spiritual superstars who's always walking with God in every moment, like those beautiful songs sing about, or if you are not just sure how to begin, here's a start. The first thing to realize is that God is always paying attention. God is always present. Like the air we breathe. We don't ask the air to demonstrate that it's there. We just breathe it. God just is. Let go of the expectation that God has to prove that God is listening. That, right there, is a huge hurdle for a lot of people. But try. I think the next thing we need to do is to allow ourselves to love God. How do you have a relationship with those you love? Do you, do you just talk to your beloved for 20 seconds in a day and then walk away and it's, it's, we're fine. I think that would be a problem in my house. I don't know about yours. But that's what God's asking for. Communicate, be honest, be open. Admit when you make a mistake. Love always and anyway, even when you're disappointed or angry, even at God. And then pray. 
Why does that intimidate people so much? Now, notice I'm not telling you to say prayers. I am suggesting that you pray. Prayer is relationship and all those things that go with good relationship. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me throughout the years telling me that their prayers don't work. Like they're broken. They need a splint. I don't know. Or that they feel funny praying. Or that they don't know what to say. Kind of like on a first date when you don't know what to do with your hands. That may be the case for you or some of you in this room, so I'm going to teach you something today. It is called a breath prayer. Breath. If you can't pray anything else, you can pray a breath prayer. They've been doing it for 14 centuries at least now, so I think it's, it's a pretty solid deal. The idea is to cue a prayer with your breathing. To name God or a characteristic of God or Jesus on your breath in. And to name your prayer on the breath out. To breathe God in and then to articulate your deepest need out. Something like peaceful God as you breathe in and then Calm my spirit as you breathe out. The idea is to repeat your breath prayer with your breathing until it becomes part of your breathing. Becomes part of who you are. Your breath prayer may be your prayer for a day or for a season. It's your prayer. So I'm going to give us a breath prayer for this morning. You don't even have to make it up yourself. It goes with our scripture, and it's very simple. I'm going to invite you as you breathe in, and I'll cue your, I'll even help you with your breathing, like a prayer with training wheels. As you breathe in, God of love, as you breathe out, Teach me to love, all right? God of love as you breathe in. Teach me to love as you breathe out. So what are we praying on the in? God is love. Teach me to love. Now, it's a silent prayer. You don't have to... The only thing we should hear is your breathing and maybe the fans. I'm going to invite us just to do that for a minute or two, and I will cue you on the breathing in and the breathing out. Let's give that a try, shall we? Let us pray. Breathe in, God is love. Breathe out, teach me to love. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. God is love. Teach me to love. Breathe in and breathe out. Amen. That's not for everyone. I know that. But try. I have found in using a breath prayer that, that sometimes it's the same prayer for a week. I'm not really in control of that. Sometimes it's my prayer for a day. Sometimes it's my prayer for a week. Sometimes when I begin praying it, I know what I'm going to say. I know what my prayer is. But by the third time through, it's, it's something different. The Spirit prays with us in ways don't ask me to explain because I can't. But there's a start. Love God from the center of who you are. Love others from that love. It's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. As simple as a prayer of the breath. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. We come together 
from prayer and singing and all those other things. To this table, this table of grace and love. We're going to use the sung responses that are in your black hymnal at 2257, which, by the way, were written by a very good friend of mine. This table in the United Methodist tradition is open to everyone. You don't have to be Methodist. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to have upheld a particular behavioral standard in the week prior to coming. What you do have to do is be willing to come and share the table with everyone. To, be come, and, to come and be willing to meet God here. Because God shows up. The Lord is with us and we lift up our hearts and we give thanks to God. Let us pray. It is indeed right, Almighty God, for you made us, and before us you made the world we inhabit. Before the world you made the eternal home in which we have a place. All that is spectacular, all that is plain have their origin in you. All that is lovely and all who are loving point to you as their fulfillment. And grateful as we are for the world we know and for the universe beyond our understanding, we particularly praise you whom eternity cannot contain, for coming to earth and entering time in Jesus, for his life which informs our living, for his compassion that changes our hearts, for his clear speaking that challenges our harmless generalities, for his disturbing presence, his innocent suffering, his fearless dying, his rising to life, breathing forgiveness. We praise and worship you and give you our eternal thanks. Here, too, our gratitude rises for the promise of the Holy Spirit, who even yet, even now, confronts us with your claims and attracts us to your goodness. Therefore, we gladly join our voices to the song of the church with its prophets and apostles, the weak and the willing, the sinners and the saints. With your people on earth and all the host of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. are you and blessed is your son Jesus the Christ and now lest we believe that our praise alone fulfills your purpose we fall silent and remember him who came because words were not enough setting our wisdom our will our words aside emptying our hearts and bringing nothing in our hands we yearn for the healing the holding the accepting the forgiving which you alone can offer what we do here, we do an imitation of what Christ first did to his followers and friends in an upstairs room in Jerusalem. He gave a command rooted in that experience. On the night before he died and as they were sitting at a meal together, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he said to them, this is my body, take and eat when the supper was over, he took the cup. And he said, this is the new covenant with God. It's made possible through sacrificial love. 
This is my blood. It is poured out. Drink and remember. So now we do as Jesus did. We take this bread and this cup, the produce of the earth, the fruit of human labor. In these, Jesus has promised to be present. Through these, God can make us whole. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Merciful God, send now in kindness as many times as we ask it. Your Holy Spirit, to bless this bread and this cup and to fill them with the fullness of Christ. And let that same Spirit rest on us, converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. one whom the universe could not contain is present to us in this bread, which is broken. The one who calls us by name meets us in this cup. Take this bread, take this cup, share this meal, for in this meal God comes to us so that we might come to God. I'm going to invite our communion stewards to come forward. The choir will go first. Communion is by intinction, which means you take the bread and dip it into the cup. All our bread is gluten-free. Mm -hmm. 